Vertical lift hills, so straight. Cable lift hills, so cable-y. Let's get into it. Now get ready, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. Thanks for coming back, I do appreciate it. This week I wanted to pick back up where I left off last week, which was last week I talked about the chain lift hills. And if you haven't seen that video, go ahead and check out that video before you watch this one because a lot of the terminology I'm going to use in this video came from that video. So please check out that video before you watch this one if you don't know what I'm talking about because I'm going to use a lot of terms and stuff in here. You might be lost if you're just coming here for the first time. So highly recommend check out that other video before you watch this one. Now let's move on to vertical lift hills. Okay, so there's a lot of rides out there that use a vertical lift hill. It was kind of its own element, which was very fascinating, but most manufacturers have picked up on this. So Intamin makes a vertical lift hill. Zamprilla makes a vertical lift hill. Gerschlauer, I'd say, probably makes the most vertical lift hills out there. And S&S rides make a vertical lift hill. People just went, S&S? It's like, yeah, your free spin models have a vertical lift hill even though they're not the, uh, the standard where you go in, up, and over, but they are vertical lift hills, so it's the same exact thing. Let's talk about vertical lift hills, and let's build the anatomy of them just like we did the chain lift hills. So what's on the inside? Well, we have a chain, which on vertical lift hills is pretty much always going to be straight link chain, and those each chain component is comprised of a link. You put links together to make the chain. On the outside of this chain though, we actually put attachments on them. There's nothing really fancy for it because when you order chains from the manufacturer, they simply just call anything else an attachment. So they put attachments on them which are actually roller wheels to each side. So you'll notice on vertical lift hills, the actual chain that you go to is always in a very wide trough compared to a traditional lift hill, which is a very <clears throat> narrow trough. So the reason the trough is wide is because it has wheels on both sides that are inside the trough. So we took a component away from the chain trough in this case, and that is the slide plates or the chain liner. There is no slide plates and chain liner inside a vertical lift hill because they use wheels. The wheels are covered in urethane, just like a roller coaster wheel is. So they're like <clears throat> miniature roller coaster wheels. Because the wheels have their own urethane and that wears down independently and the chain never actually touches steel, there is no need for liner on the inside of that chain trough. It is simply just the trough has now turned into a guide. Now you have a chain guide sitting there. And the chain's put together, every single link has two wheels, one on each side, and it goes all the way around and comes back around there. The chain in these particular rides typically have two more attachments to them, which are your pushers, your pushing dogs, again, manufacturer just calls it a lifting attachment, but they have two of those 180 degrees apart from each other. In some of these chains cases, the dog is actually mounted to the chain, um, like it's physically part of the chain. And other cases, the dog is mounted onto the chain, which means it's an external component that's bolted onto or mounted onto the chain. So it's something that would come apart each year and get its own NDT and everything else uh, with the rest of the train. So you'd have to go out there and NDT those pushing dogs as well. Anti-rollbacks, let's see. The, the A lot of rides use anti-rollbacks on them still. A lot of these vertical lifts use anti-rollbacks on them. The older Gerschlauers and the s, s rides use the tooth rail that runs up the side. And they both use anti-rollback suppressors to quiet them down. So you're not hearing them drag against there the entire time. The s, &S use a com uses a wheel running assembly almost like a truck that keeps the anti-rollback pulled away from the rail up until it gets until it detects motion the other way and then it drops the anti-rollback down into the rail. The same thing with Gerschlauers, they do the exact same thing. Um, the majority of those rides, however, use 
the older rides used a little cleat off to the side running on a rail next to the, the anti-rollback. So you'll see this on some lifts. You'll see the chain trough. You'll see the anti-rollbacks, the teeth on both sides, the tooth rail on both sides of it. And then you'll see two more things right next to that. Those two things right next to it, which are typically steel in areas where there's high cordling, um, typically at the base where you make the 90 degree curve up, the a lot of times that is plastic on a lot of the Gerschlauer rides. I've even seen some that use brushes for some reason. I don't know. Maybe they didn't want to cut the plastic and put it in there. Maybe they had some sort of alternate idea. But that is to keep the anti-rollbacks up away from the teeth as the train starts to go up. So that is a new component that we've added to a lot of things on a lot of rides is to make the lifts quiet is anti-rollback suppression. A lot of rides have them. So the lift hill, the anatomy is pretty much the same. You have a tail sprocket, you have a head sprocket, and you have a bull sprocket. Now the difference is, is because you have that lifting dog or that pushing dog on there, because you have that pushing dog on there, you can now not wrap the chain the opposite direction around an idler sprocket. Because that pusher is on one side, you can wrap it on the bottom side, but you can't have it come the other way because, well, that's where the dog is and the teeth can't go in right there um, from that direction. They can go in the other way, but not that one. So what ends up happening is that on a lot of these rides, they take the chain, it goes up and over the crown of the lift, over the head sprocket, back down, and then it typically goes 90 degrees, somewhere around there, around the bull sprocket, the drive sprocket at the bottom. Unique body proportions may not be able to be accommodated. Be aware that leaving the line for any reason. And then comes back around a tail sprocket, and honestly, the tail sprocket is where it's tensioned. because it's one, it's uniform, and it could be pulled one direction the entire time. So lift motor is standard. You could tension these rides also at the head sprocket, but you wanna typically, as a ride manufacturer, you wanna move the majority of your work as low to the ground as possible. This way, your mechanics are more likely to do the work. Because sometimes if you make it really hard and out of the way and crazy to get to, Mechanics simply just don't do the work and the ride goes into neglect. So that's an unwanted thing. So you have your tensioner, which is also your, typically your tail sprocket. You have your bull wheel and you have your head wheel. That's, those are the three main components of these rides. And then everywhere else, the chain sits in a guide trough, essentially, so that it's protected running around the ride the rest of the way. The two pushers, how I talked about them, or the lifting dogs, how they're 180 degrees apart. You could see this on rides. You see, if you watch the top, as one of the coaches goes over the top, a lot of the times you can see the lifting dog come down over the sprocket and it kind of stops there. And then what it's doing is it's waiting right there because down below, the next car is advancing, the next train is advancing. And once the next train gets into there and it says, okay, we wanna start the lifting process, then you'll see that pusher car slightly start to come down really slow. That's where the one at the bottom is latching in. And then you'll see that one up on top start to accelerate down as the next one comes up. Hundred and eighty degrees apart. Again, you can tell that because if you watch that little pusher, lifting dog, as it comes down, it passes the coach on the way up. So right in the middle of the ride, it'll pass the coach right there. So it's like, yep, there's two of those on there. They're hundred and eighty degrees apart. Look for that sometime.
Okay, moving along into the next subject, we're going to talk about cable lifts. So cable lifts is one that's coming up more common these days, uh, but still not quite as common as your basic chain lifts, but they are out there. So realistically, your biggest manufacturer of cable lifts out there is Intamin. They pretty much make all the cable lifts that are running right now. Um, I know there's some off man, you know, there's some little one off here and there, but I'm talking like the majority. When you look at the majority of cable lift rides, they're typically Intamin. So, what is a cable lift? Well, it's a lift, just like a chain lift, but instead of a chain in there, we've taken that out and we've replaced that assembly with a cable. Now, the cables have an entirely different structure to them. Uh, so that is something that is going to be unique for this. So we kind of have to redo what we've learned in the last couple. And we have to say, okay, now what are we going to do here? Well, <clears throat> where do we start? Let's start with why you'd use a cable over a chain. So basically you can make cable lift hills really steep. So you could do that with chains too. But you could speed them up really fast and there's hardly any wear and tear on the inside components because it's a cable moving and there's no real moving parts to it other than the cable itself. So you can accelerate trains quickly up an area with a cable lift hill. Uh, one of my, my first experience with a cable lift hill honestly was, of all things, it was Skyrush over at Hershey Park. And everyone says, that has a fast lift and it looked fast sitting in the queue line for it and then when I got on it, it was like, holy crap, that was fast getting to the top. Like, wow, that was amazing. So that was an interesting ride to go on. That's my first cable lift experience was the fastest one out there. So on a chain lift, you would have slide plates that the chain goes on the entire time. That's that UHMW that lines it. On a cable lift hill, you are now using rollers. So these are Basically like you would see on aerial tramways, um, they used them on King the Ka and, and Top Thrills when it was doing that. Um, it's basically, it looks like a big roller coaster wheel, a little bit wider, and it has a rubber U-groove in it essentially. So that rubber groove is where the cable lays. So cables can't slide over stuff, they don't like to, so they like to roll over stuff, That's so they use rollers for everything. And they've used these in aerial tramways forever. So there's lots of history behind them. We know they work. We know they can carry extreme heavy loads. It's essentially a roller coaster wheel with a rubber lining on it so it doesn't damage the cable. So we use those as it goes up and over the crown of the lift hill. And then as it crowns over that lift hill with all those rollers on there, then it goes down and stops. And now those are all the rollers that the ride needs. On the bottom side of lift hill, so the rollers basically turn into your head pulley, your head idler up there. Those are all those rollers. Your tail sprocket, or in this case the tail pulley, is the exact same thing. It's just a pulley down there at the very base and it's in a straight line with the rest of lift hill. That way the cable pulls down straight. So you have straight, straight, straight up until the crown and then it goes over all those little pulleys and then most of these cable lift hills go straight down from there because you don't like to contort cable all over the place. The less you have to bend a cable, the better off you are. So underneath the lift hill, on average, down there where it goes off and it goes typically straight down on these rides, that's where the cable goes down and that's where it goes to its winch package that's sitting down there at the very bottom on the ground. Before I get into that, Let's talk about how many cables there are on one of these lift hills. There's typically two cables. There's one pulling and there's one retracting. Now, the one that pulls goes up and over from the winch package. It goes straight up over the crown of the lift hill and comes back down and meets up with the catch car. On the back side of that catch car, that cable goes straight down the lift, goes around the idler pulley, and then comes back. But before it gets back, it goes through a tensioner. So the tensioner is designed just like a lift hill, like a chain tensioner. It's designed to put tension on that entire assembly. Now that's done simply just to keep cables from slapping and banging on things. 
So when cables, when you go to move them, they like to jump, they like to hop, they like to move all over the place. So the more tension you put on those cables, the tighter they become, more like a guitar string, and it just becomes very tight and straight in that one area, and it doesn't move. So you're saying like, well, I've heard cables slap up on hills before, like I've, I've heard them do that, well, what's the big deal? Well, if it slaps, that means it's loose. So if it's too loose, I mean, granted a, a big structure with a 300 foot tall lift hill, it's going to do that. But if it's too loose, that slapping can continue up around the top, the crown of the ride, and then that can maybe get out of those idler wheels up there. And then once it's out of those idler wheels up on top, you now have a steel cable rubbing on a steel surface, probably being pulled between pinch points, and you're looking at snapping the cable at that point it's gonna be a really bad thing. So two cables from the catch car over the top down to the winch package, bottom cable around the idler and then through a tensioner mechanism. And the tensioners are typically weight driven. It's just two idler pulleys with another idler in the center that has weight pulling down on it the entire time to, to keep the entire mechanism tensioned. Now, the winch package, unlike a traditional lift motor where it just sits there and spins one direction the entire time, the winch package on these guys is more like, think about like the hydraulic drum on King Ka or on some of the other hydraulic launch rides, how they have multiple cables on the drum. It's the same exact thing. So you have one cable coming into the drum this way, one cable coming into the drum this way. And when the drum turns one direction, the drum turns one direction, it's going to feed cable out this direction and then it's going to pull cable in this direction causing the catch car to go up the lift hill so and then once it stops at the top if you'll notice on most of those rides they all go over and they come down the lift hill a very far ways and stop well you can't just open the brake and let it drift backwards because it's too far down that side of the drop so you have physically have to tell that drive motor to reverse and go the opposite direction. And then it pulls that catch car back up and over the crown and back down to the bottom. So the drive motor has a gearbox. It's got its own set of brakes on it. It's got a very big brake, like an elevator brake on there, very big off to the side. And that brake holds that entire assembly. Now that is also your first stage of the anti-rollback on that because the lift hill has its own anti-rollback system with the train. But that aside, the cable has its own anti-rollback system, which if you remember back to the lift video, the chain lift video, the anti-rollback system for this is the brake on the side of the motor. Okay, so we've taken that guy and now we've been able to feed it one direction. And then we've reversed it and fed it back the other direction. So let's talk about the catch car itself now. The catch car itself is kind of like a segment of chain. They're made up of multiple components. The catch car that the cable links to is actually very small. It's a very small thing that both cables hook onto on each side. Uh, on the one side of the catch car, you could see the cable from the top. It simply just goes in, and with a giant clevis, it just goes right into that catch car. On the bottom, you can't see the cable attached. That's because that first, it looks like, segment of that catch car is where the cable hooks up to underneath. But it's, this catch car has a tail. It's more like a chain. So the tail is multiple links that come back down, and they're flat, typically like plate steel-looking devices, but they're actually like little bogeys, little wheel carriers, basically, as it goes back down. And the reason for that is because the lift hill is straight. So the catch car has to come back down and it has to stay straight. So they kept it straight and they stopped it right there. And then they said, well, our, our train, catch car is here, but our train's here. We need to hook up to that train. Well, what are we going to do? So most revisions, they said, we're going to build these little extensions for the catch car, these little tiny links that go from the catch car, and they go link, 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 and they curve down in the trough. 
and these have wheels just like a roller chain uh, with uh, wheels on the side for a vertical lift. These have wheels off to the side as well. And they go down that guide trough and they curve underneath and they go all the way back to the train. And then there is a pickup section of that that sits there. It's a little opening that's got basically a, a bull nose, a curved nose on it. And basically it sits there right in front of the chain dog. And then when the ride's ready and it's in position, what it does is it sends that little opening backwards just enough for that chain dog or lifting dog to drop into that opening and then it starts to pull the train forward and then pulls it out of the station. So that's how the catch wagon, the catch car, can actually link onto a train through a curve without actually bending the cable through the curve itself. So they use that snake-like catch car to just go back and grab the train itself. So I would call this a traditional style catch car. So these are used on rides like Skyrush, Millennium Force, uh, Intimidator 305. At this point in the video, if you haven't already, please make sure you like and subscribe and give me some comments down there. Let me know if you've got any fun stories to add on to these. And then let me know if you want to see something for topics in the future too. I'm always up for new stuff. I've got a list of things that I'm making, but sometimes somebody says something and I'm like, oh yeah, let's do that one real quick. That, that really sounds like fun. I do enjoy getting that information. You guys come up with a lot of good ideas for videos, so let me know if you got them. You can also email me at ryanthereidemechanic at yahoo.com. Let's get back into the video. The length of the catch car does vary just a little bit depending on how far back the train is from the beginning of the station. Like Intimidator 305, the train is very close to the lift hill. As opposed to Millennium Force, it looks like it's a little further back. So when I was talking about the other side, how that drop comes down and you know that that catch wagon that catch car has to go way down the other side well that's because it's got to go way down there because the catch car is realistically 40 or 50 feet long to where the lifting dog or chain dog actually hooked up so you're talking about when the vehicle crowns and it crests over that that point is actually 40 feet 50 feet away from where the catch wagon actually is. So that's why they have to go so far down the drop on the other side to do that. Any rollbacks on these rides are also the same. Instead of using a tooth rail, they typically use like a, a beam that's been slotted or notched that goes all the way up. And they use the wide rail because Intamin likes to use a wheel that runs alongside the thing. And basically, it's it's a complicated little device that sits on there, but it's basically a wheel that uses kind of eddy currents to lift the dog up as it's driving up the lift hill. And then basically when the train stops, the eddy currents stop as well, just like a brake. So the eddy currents stop in that rotation and the dog simply just falls down into place. And if it didn't fall down, the eddy currents would force it back down as soon as the train started moving backwards. So the second type of cable lift hill catch that I want to talk about is more of a dynamic catch. Uh, let's see, these are used in rides like El Toro and Goliath. They basically don't do the part where the catch car snakes back to grab the train. They simply just lay in wait in that static position. The catch car itself on the lift hill, like the Millennium Force, Instead of having a long tail to it to grab the train, it is simply just a catch car right there on the lift. And there's an opening for it, just like the, the snake had, just like on that snake catch car. had the same opening in it, but it's waiting on the lift hill. So what Intamin did in these cases is they took the train out of the station, they advanced it around to the lift hill. Like a lot of rides, they use booster wheels to feed that train up the lift and then basically use proximity sensors to say that once the train passes this point, it's typically they read it off the back of the train. I mean, the, the point never really changes, doesn't matter. So they say once the train passes this point, we are going to take the motor and turn it on and go forward. 
So what they've done is they've said, we're feeding that up. And right when that chain dog or catch dog drops in to that pocket, as soon as it clears and drops in, we tell the lift to start. And the lift turns on a crawl speed. And basically it takes the train and seamlessly just picks it up and starts going the same speed it was feeding it at. And then as soon as it's cleared another proximity in the lift base, it goes to its fast speed and speeds up all the way up and over. Now, the advantage of this is that you don't have to have the long runoff on the top end, like El Toro, where you can just go up and it basically just stops up there and it just releases and the train just starts to roll forward on its own. As opposed to the older models, you'd have to have this giant runoff down there for that snake catch wagon catch car to go down the other side. And for both styles, both the traditional style catch and the dynamic catch, both of them run off the same thing. They both run off the same winch package. And when they run the catch car backwards da back down the lift hill, they do the same thing. They use a series of proximity sensors to say, here it comes, slow down, slow down, and then a final proximity sensor to say, stop, I'm in position. And in the dynamic catch scenario, you would use, say, I'm in position, and then when that last when that first prox dropped out, it says go into low speed. And when the second prox drops out, it says, okay, high speed, take the train. The tensioner mechanisms on the dynamic catch are typically the exact same, um, but you don't have to have them that way. I mean, they can be the exact same, but you don't have to have them that way. Uh, I've noticed on El Toro, they use what looks like a pneumatic actuator pulling tension on the return sprocket or return pulley down there. So it looks like they use pneumatic force to do that, which is perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, weight works great as long as you never want that really changed too much. But tensioners are great because you could just adjust the spring tension or the air pressure on them, and it'll pull more weight onto that cable. As far as mechanics working on stuff, uh, lift hills in general, it's like, well, now is when you find out if you're afraid of heights or not. <laughs> um, during the interview process, I would always ask mechanics, are you afraid of heights? And they'd say, no, I've climbed up all sorts of stuff, which is perfectly fine. Um, some people just guess that. Uh, I know when I was in my interview, I guessed it because they said, are you afraid of heights? I'm like, I don't think I am, but I don't, I haven't been presented with all the scenarios to say that I am or am not. Uh, but when you work on lift hills, you might have the fear of God put into you for sure, depending on what you're doing. If you have to repel off the side of the something and go down 50 feet to work on the, the, mil, the middle of nothing out there, it might be pretty scary for you. So some mechanics find a, a, a new religion when they have to work on the bottom side of a lift hill. Because the top side is easy. There's catwalks and gratings and lifts and like all sorts of tools to work on the top. It's the bottom is where it gets pretty sketchy.
your seat belt, lift up on your straight, and exit towards your left. Have a great day. If you spin your right on, watch for opening gate. <laughs> All right, I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic. As always, stay off the air gates. Bye.